All right, hello everyone and welcome to uh, Lightning Components 101 and Apex Developer's Guide. Uh, so I am uh, happy to be presenting to you today. Uh, my name is Adam Olshamsky and uh, let's get started. Uh, I wanna start off by introducing Apex Hours uh, led by Amit Chowdhury. Uh, you can find him on the Salesforce developer community, uh, blogging on his uh, blog, I'm at salesforce.blogspot.in. He's also the co-organizer of the Farmington Hills Salesforce user group, uh, and also the founder of Apex Hours. And feel free to check him out online at Amit underscore SFDC or at Apex Hours on Twitter. Uh, as for me, my name is Adam Olshansky. I'm a Salesforce MVP, Salesforce engineer at Google, the Google devices team. I have over 600 Trailhead badges and 14 certifications, but I'm really passionate about helping people learn how to code on the Salesforce platform. Uh, also a rad women coach, and I love getting involved overall with the Salesforce community. Uh, feel free to connect with me afterward on Twitter at Adam17AMO. Uh, check out my blog, adamtoarchitect.com. And if you're not yet on the Lightning Experience and you're interested in some tips for migrating, uh, Plural site course that might help you out. Uh, check that out at bit.ly slash lightning migration. All right, so with that, let's get started into our, our content here. And before we dive into lightning components, I'm gonna kind of give a brief overview of why exactly I want to uh, give this talk. And uh, this is kind of my development journey, if you will. I kind of feel like it's a mountain that I'm going up. All right, so we started off, uh, you know, I'm a back-end developer working on Apex, happily, you know, going up along my developer journey. And along the way, I've been hearing terms come in and out, terms like front-end and JavaScript and client-side. And all these terms, you know, you hear them, but, you know, you don't necessarily dive into them too much. You maybe ignore them, make a plan to look them up later and don't get around to it. And you know, this is kind of my developer journey. I heard all these terms, I was vaguely familiar with what they were, but never really took the time to invest in them. And then I started seeing statistics like this. Uh, this was a poll done last year by Stack Overflow of 72,000 professional developers. And for the seventh year in a row, turns out the most popular used development language is JavaScript. Almost 70% of developers reported using JavaScript. Close second, HTML and CSS, of course, all of these being the languages of the web of front-end development. So it's pretty clear JavaScript is pretty popular and has been for a while now. And in case Stack Overflow wasn't enough proof, you see statistics like this from GitHub, where once again, since 2013, seven years in a row, uh, the most pull requests are coming uh, to GitHub in the form of JavaScript. 20%, in fact, of all requests, all pull requests from GitHub are for JavaScript. And so JavaScript, like I said, been pretty, pretty popular for a while now. Uh, in case you're curious, Apex was 39th. And so you hear all these terms, you see that JavaScript's been pretty popular and you realize, uh oh, <laughs> I'm up a mountain and don't really have any safety net or harness or a way to get back down. Uh, it's kind of scary. Uh, JavaScript's here, it's popular, it's here to stay. I'm a backend Apex developer. What do I do about that? And I figured I probably wasn't the only one in that position. And that's really why I wanted to give this talk today. And so my expectations for you are that you're an Apex developer uh, or some sort of backend developer doing backend code. Uh, I don't want you walking out of this talk thinking you're gonna be able to learn JavaScript in under an hour. I'm not sure 40 hours would actually be enough to learn JavaScript. But what I do want you to walk out of here understanding is that uh, you can understand some common patterns that go along with front-end development and hopefully gain confidence to start the process of looking into building components yourself. And so I'm kind of framing this as the first step in conquering the mountain, conquering your front-end part of your developer journey. All right, so in terms of our agenda for today, start off with an apex overview, high-level stuff you already know. Uh, talk about kind of what are components, what do we mean when we say component development? going to do a demo and a comparison of Visual Force and Lightning Web Components, a deep dive into Lightning Web Components with a couple of demos, and then we're going to wrap things up uh, and talk about step two and three, kind of where do we go from here after this talk today. All right, so let's start off with a review of what we already know, Apex Overview. 
All right, for the most part, Apex comes in two flavors. You got your triggers, you got your classes and controllers, right? And in your triggers, you have uh, your events uh, that are causing this code to fire, right? Your before insert, your after update, these database events happen, your code fires, great. Your classes in your controllers, this is where your methods are, your parameters, your return statements, and then you got variables mixed in there. So we already know all this. Uh, we're also probably familiar with some of these other kind of keywords, right? We're used to annotating methods with that future, uh, asynchronous Apex in general. But we also might be familiar with batchable and queuable interfaces that require certain methods to be in the code for it to work, right? All of our batchable classes have to have an execute method, it's just part of the syntax of using batchable. Uh, we're kind of familiar with that concept already from Apex. And then we're also kind of already familiar with Visual Force, right? The MVC model, model uh, MVC framework, model view controller, uh, this idea of using HTML style tags, right? Apex page, Apex data table, Apex page block, right? We're familiar with that. Uh, and then if we want to reference our Apex controller for our Visual Force page, bind variables, bind methods, we're familiar with that syntax, the curly bracket bang uh, syntax in Visual Force as well to reference our controller. Uh, Apex and Visual Force, there are, say, some gaps, <laughs> right? We might be hitting some governor limits. Um, it's kind of 90s technology. It's very button-click based. I have to keep clicking anytime I want anything to happen. Um, not always great performance. And ultimately, we end up with solutions like this, kind of hacked together. Maybe I go online, find a random JavaScript uh, script, put in a script tag on my Visual Force page, drop the script in, copy and paste. I don't know what it does, but it seems to make the page work, so I don't question it. Kind of throw it all together, and it doesn't look great, but it works. Um, there has to be a better way than that, right? And as a developer, you know that those kind of solutions are only going to get you so far. All right, so let's talk about a uh, new programming model, right? You might hear it referred to as MVCC. I like to call it MVC++. Um, but it has a lot of the characteristics of MVC with a little bit more on top of it. Uh, so before we do that, let's take a quick trip down uh, Salesforce's developer journey. Right? Salesforce, of course, founded uh, in the late 1990s. And uh, you know they were going strong for a while, realized that people wanted to be able to customize their own UI. And in the you know, 90s and 2000s, everything was very button-click based. Web development was just kind of becoming a thing. Uh, so Salesforce comes out with Visual Force and Dreamforce in 2007. And it was great. You can customize UIs. It was fine for a while. Um, but as we saw, JavaScript's been king since 2013. And Salesforce realized this. And Salesforce decided to take the open source Aura framework and adopt it for Salesforce. And they came out with the Aura component framework using this uh, open source Aura framework. And it allowed us to really make things more uh, responsive, it was kind of JavaScript based, and that worked fine for a while too. Uh, as web standards improved, Salesforce said, you know what, we need to adapt, and we're going to kind of adapt to this new web standard framework. And that's where the Lightning Web Component Framework was launched in January of 2019. And so that's kind of Salesforce's path and how they got here. Uh, where we were back with Visual Force and MVC, uh, everything was happening in Salesforce. Everything was happening on the server side, right? Our Visual Force page was on in Salesforce. Our application logic, right? The controller is in Salesforce. The database, the objects and the fields, the model, that's all in Salesforce. And we were making calls from our client, from our laptop, from our browser. We're making a call to Salesforce. We're doing some processing. It's sending it back to us uh, so that we can see it, but there's a kind of a round trip call of everything being called to Salesforce, being done in Salesforce, and then being sent back to us and everything was happening on the Salesforce side on the server. Uh, we're gonna change things up now a little bit with our, our new framework, our MVC++ framework. Uh, so we're still gonna have an Apex controller in Salesforce. Apex isn't going anywhere. That's still gonna live in Salesforce. And we're not doing anything with our data model. Our objects and our fields, that's still all in Salesforce. So our M and our C are still in Salesforce. The view though, is actually going to move to the client side, to the browser. So our view is going to be off of Salesforce and into the browser now. And because the view is being rendered in the browser, we want to take advantage of that. So we're going to add a front-end controller, a JavaScript controller, in the browser. So we don't have to call Salesforce for every single thing to have Apex Calculate. We can respond to events happening in the browser, and then we render them immediately in the browser without having to do that round-trip server call. 
So we still have a model. We still have our view. It's just on the client side now. And now we're going to have two controllers, a front-end controller in the browser and a back-end controller in Salesforce. All right. Uh, let's talk for a minute about what this idea is of a lightning component. Right? When we talk about components, we're just talking about a bundle of files, a collection of files that intrinsically know about each other. Right? So just like with Apex, there are kind of two flavors. Right? We have Aura components and we have Lightning Web components. And today we're going to be focusing on Lightning Web components. At this point, if you haven't already started learning Aura, you're probably better off just skipping straight to LWC. So at this point, all an Aura component is is a Lightning Web component that's wrapped up in some wrapping that comes with a performance hit. So a Lightning component is essentially a better version of an Aura component, if you will. Uh, and so all we mean when we talk about a component is some sort of UI file, some sort of controller it automatically knows about, uh, maybe a CSS file it automatically knows about. And in the case of Lightning Web Components, we're going to be working with our XML file that comes as part of that bundle. But it's just a collection of files that know about each other. That's what we mean when we say component. All right. So before we get into all the new stuff with components, let's talk about some of the old stuff with components. What's not changing? Right. So we're going to go through this step by step here and talk about some of the stuff that's staying the same uh, with Lightning Web Components compared to Visual Force, what we already know. Uh, so the first one is this concept of UI components, right? In Visual Force, we have HTML style tags. They all start with Apex, right? Apex page, Apex page block, uh, Apex input, right? We have all these Apex tags. And with Lightning Web Components, we're still going to have those HTML style tags. We're just going to have, it's going to look a little bit different because it's the Lightning Web Component framework. Instead of having Apex tags, we're going to have Lightning tags. So instead of Apex input, you're going to see Lightning input. We're also going to be taking advantage of web standards, as I mentioned. So we're going to have some standard HTML tags in there. They're not even going to be Salesforce specific in a lot of cases. And the last type of tag we're going to see are these tags starting with the letter C. And C just means it's in the default namespace, right? If we were working with an ISV, we might have a different namespace in there. But for our purposes, we're just going to see C which just means it's a custom component that we built in our namespace uh, and we're bringing it in uh, to a parent component. But the concept of UI components is something we're used to already. Next thing we're kind of used to already, this notion of event-based code, right? Our triggers, before insert, after update, some database event happens and our code fires. Well, now we're not just listening to events on the database anymore, we're listening to events in the browser. So we're going to be listening to some browser events as well to fire off code, right? Today we're going to talk about a couple of them. One of them is on change. So when a value changes on the page on the browser, we want to fire off some code. And when a user clicks a button, yeah, we're going to want some code to fire them too. So we're going to have an on-click event to handle that. Bind variables, again, not much is changing here. The syntax is a little bit different. We're taking away the exclamation point, but our Lightning Web component UIs is still going to be able to reference variables via the bind syntax for the Lightning Web Component Controller. And the same thing with methods, right? We're still going to have that bind syntax, it's going to look slightly different with that, the exclamation point, but for the most part, we're used to that, right? So here again, because we're having two different controllers, if we want our front end UI to call our front end controller, we're going to have the curly bracket syntax. If we want our front end controller to call our back end controller, we're actually going to be able to reference it by giving it a name, just like we would a variable. Uh, so we're going to be able to choose what name we want uh, for that in our front-end controller. And the last thing that we're already kind of used to is this notion of working with multiple files at once. So with Visual Force, right, we have our Visual Force page. We tell it what Apex controller we want to work with. Our Apex controller is maybe going to call a utility class or a helper class, right? We have a couple files we're working with. The only difference is with Lightning Web Components, the Specific types of files will change, but we're still going to have a UI file, an HTML file. We're still going to have a front end controller, or we're still going to have a primary controller, a JavaScript controller in this case. And then we're also going to have an Apex controller or multiple Apex controllers if we want as well. Uh, but this notion of working with multiple files really isn't anything new. All right, so let's do a little comparison uh, between Visual Force and Lightning Web Components here. So let's go look at a uh, comparison here. So 
we have two components here. We have hello world and hello LWC. And so I'm gonna start with my visual force page first. I'm gonna say hello apex hours. So I type in apex hours. I have a button here that says update. I click update, takes half a second. And then we see hello apex hours showing up here. All right, so I typed something in, clicked a button, text showed up there. All right, it's kind of cool. Let's take a look at my lightning web component now though. We start off with hello world. And I'm gonna type in apex hours. I didn't have to click any buttons. I didn't have to have any apex either. And my UI automatically updated to show whatever is in my text box here. If I wanna write something more, how are you? I can write as much as I want and it's gonna automatically update the UI as I'm typing. So I think it's pretty cool. Let's take a look at how it did that then. All right, so let's start with our hello world.page, our visual force page. Uh, first thing we're gonna see here is we're referencing a controller. So we have to tell it what Apex controller we wanna work with. And then we have some standard visual force components, right? We have Apex page, Apex page block. Uh, the primary things here, the output text and the input text. So we have some sort of output text and then we have an Apex input. Uh, we see our button is going to tell our output to re-render. So when we click that update button, we want our output to re-render. And the input is going to reference the greeting variable in the value parameter. And our output is also gonna reference that greeting variable and just say, hello, greeting. And so again, we click that button, our update, our output updates based on whatever we typed into the input. Uh, the Apex controller here is pretty simple just to get her and set her for the greeting variable. But we are making that round trip again to and from Salesforce and so we do have to uh, have that little performance hit while we wait for it to update. If we take a look at the Lightning Web Component though, this is the UI file for that HTML file. And just like we would with Apex form, we have an equivalent component in or an Apex page, blo page block, maybe an equivalent component in LWC, the Lightning card. Um, but again, the primary parts of this are just output an output component and an input component. Our output component in this case is just a standard HTML tag, the paragraph tag P. And our input component, again, instead of Apex input, we have Lightning input. Uh, but it's essentially doing the same thing, right? Our input is just the value of greeting, our greeting bind variable. And our output just says, hello, greeting. Uh, we also see this event-based code I was talking about before. So we're looking, in this case, for when our input changes. Whenever something I type into that input changes, we want to fire off some code to handle that. So that's our onChange event. And our onChange event is going to fire off a method in this bind syntax, again, that we've called handle change. Right, so we know we have a greeting variable and we know we have a handle change method. Let's go take a look at them in our controller here. So, and again, remember, I don't have to tell my Lightning Web Component what controller to use because it's all part of the same bundle. So my hello world at HTML references my hello world controller.js. And I see a couple things here. First line, line number one, uh, I see the word import. If you're familiar with developing in Java, uh, you may be used to importing different things from different places, different libraries. Basically, you can bring things in from other places and give you additional functionality. Same sort of thing with Lightning Web Components. So pretty much every Lightning Web Component you're going to write is going to have some variant of line one and line three here. We're going to import Lightning Element from the LWC namespace, and we're going to export our component and extend the Lightning Element that we just imported. And again, just like with the batchable queuable interfaces, right? You use the interface and you have to include certain parts of the code. Same thing here with Lightning Web Components. We need to import from LWC and we need to export uh, extending Lightning Element. Uh, if I take a look at the actual component code though, uh, this first thing here in line four we see, we see our greeting variable again. Uh, we also see this word at track. And at track is called the decorator. We're gonna see three of them today and at track is the first one. And decorators are essentially an annotation we can give a variable to give it some extra properties. In the case of at track, it's gonna do two things. Number one, it's gonna make it a private variable. And number two, it's gonna make it reactive, meaning it'll automatically re-render itself in the UI when it changes. So if you remember in our visual force, we'd tell our button, hey, can you re-render my output when you're clicked? By at tracking our variable, it's gonna re-render itself. We don't have to do that anymore. Uh, something cool to note with the summer 20 release, 
Uh, almost all variables are at tracked automatically now, so we might not see this decorator explicitly as much anymore. Um, it's still good to know what it does uh, and why it's there. So we have our greeting, which is at tracked, and we're setting it to a default value of world. Line six now, remember, on change fires our handle change event. And so our handle change method here is, uh, or handle change method rather, and our handle change method is defined here in line six. Uh, it's capturing the thing that called it, so the event of me changing the input. And then all I'm doing in line seven is taking whatever value was in the thing that fired the event and assigning it to the greeting variable. So my greeting variable, basically all that means is whatever I'm typing becomes the greeting variable. And because it's at tracked, it's automatically re-rendering itself in the UI. Pretty cool, no apex needed at all. All right, so what did we see here? Well, first we saw component markup, right? We saw a lightning input tag, we saw a paragraph tag, we saw a template tag, right? This idea of tag-based markup. Uh, we saw code running based on events. Our onChange event fired off some code in our controller. We saw some variable and method bindings that really haven't changed since Visual Force. We saw that because our controller was part of the bundle, uh, we don't need to explicitly reference it anymore. And we saw that we didn't need any Apex. Uh, to be able to do something even faster than we did in Visual Force. All right, so let's go take a deep dive now into Lightning Web Components specifically. And the tagline here is really the embracing of standards. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you go back to 2014, around the time Aura was being developed, uh, this is kind of how the web looked, right? And don't worry too much about every little line in here, but focus more on the ratio of green to orange. And in this case, the green represents what frameworks we're doing. So you've probably heard of other frameworks like Angular and React, right? JavaScript frameworks were pretty heavy. And this orange part is kind of the web standards. This is what the web standards look like in 2014. They existed. We see how JavaScript's been on top since 2013, right? They were out there, but they weren't doing a whole lot. The frameworks were doing a lot of the heavy lifting. If you fast forward to 2019 though, that ratio has really shifted, right? Now we see that the frameworks are actually pretty lightweight and the web standards have developed to the point that they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting now. And so Salesforce decided to adapt and that's where the Lightning Web Component model came in. So we moved from our Aura framework doing a lot of the heavy lifting to the web standards being able to do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. So in Lightning Web Components, we still see Salesforce security involved. We still see the Lightning data service involved that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, we still see, you know, Lightning-based components like Lightning Input, right? There are some custom components Salesforce has built as part of this framework, but they're taking advantage of a lot more standard web functionality as we've seen are so popular and have been for some time now, which I think is pretty exciting. So we talked about what's old with components. Let's talk about what's new with components. And the very first thing is the thing I just talked about, those industry standards. Salesforce has actually joined a bunch of the web industry standards boards now. And so they're gonna have a say in how the web standards develop over time, which is pretty exciting, I think. And gonna make it uh, a lot faster to get new features into Salesforce. Uh, it also is good, I think, from the developer ecosystem for two reasons. Number one, you're able to expand your skills by learning skills that are not only relevant just to Salesforce, but to any web framework out there that we've seen are so popular and have been for some time. The other cool thing it does is it expands the developer ecosystem. So now anyone, any of those, you know, 70% of developers working with JavaScript can bring their skills over to Salesforce and say, you know, hey, I've been doing web standard development for a while now. Why don't I just do it on Salesforce? And we're gonna see a lot of uh, synergy with that as well. So I think it's pretty exciting overall, uh, both as a developer and for the ecosystem at large. Uh, the next thing we're going to see is we're moving all the logic to one spot. So you might remember, remember that, you know, hacky car that I showed you before. We kind of had that in some other parts of Visual Force also. For example, in bind syntax, we can throw in a curly bracket bang. Maybe we have a variable, maybe we have some text, maybe we have another variable, some more text, just all appended together. We're not doing that anymore, right? It violates MVC. All of the logic should be in the controller, and that's where it's moving to an LWC. Uh, the other thing we're going to see is this idea of multiple Apex controllers. For the most part, in Visual Force, you define a controller and everything has to be in that controller. Uh, but now with LWC, we can have as many controllers as we want, which is why I like to call it MVC++. Right, we can just keep adding controllers. Different controllers come from different places doing different things. Separation of duties, I think it's a win overall and helps us keep things organized. 
And then the last thing uh, that I want to talk about that's new with web components are decorators. Uh, so we saw at track already, and we're going to see two more in a minute here. All right. Uh, so let's get into a Lightning Web Component demo here. Um, I'm going to go through kind of the highlights of the code like I did before. Uh, if you don't catch every single line, don't know what every single line means, don't worry about it. The code will be made available to you afterward. Um, but I want you to really focus on the concepts of what's happening here. And the other thing in the first component we're going to take a look at, remember there is no Apex involved at all. So let's go take a look at our create accounts component here. All right, so I have a uh, Lightning Web component called create accounts. Uh, or rather LDS create record, LDS being Lightning Data Service, uh, LDS create record, and we see a couple things on the page here. Uh, number one, we see this ID field uh, that's kind of disabled here, so we can't really do anything with it. Uh, we see we have a name field that we can type into. We have a button, and then we have this section here that says create a record without writing server-side code. Consider using Lightning Record Form, Lightning Record Edit Form first. And we have a link here. If we click on this view source link, it's going to take us to a GitHub repository referencing this LDS create record component. All right, uh, so that's kind of cool. So we can reference the source of where this code came from. Uh, but let's actually see what it does. So I'm going to go create an account here. I'm going to call it Apex Hours. I'm going to click create account. And a second here, I'm going to see a toast that says my account was created. And I'm going to get an ID. So it ends in J31AAF. If I go take a look at my accounts here, sure enough, I see a new account here, Apex Hours, J31AAF. That's kind of cool. Uh, I was able to create an account, no Apex involved at all. Uh, maybe I want to change this up a little bit. I want to create a new account. As soon as I type anything in here, that ID goes away, and now all of a sudden I'm not talking about my Apex Hours account anymore. I'm talking about a new account. So Apex Hour LWC, for example. Maybe I'll create another account. Again, we see account created. Uh, and if I go back to my accounts, I should see that second account, Apex Hour LWC there. Okay, great. Uh, so just created two accounts, no Apex at all. How did we do that? Let's go take a look at the code for that too. All right, so here's our LDS create record component. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, um, but again, focus on the high level concepts here. Uh, first thing we see is a template tag. So just like all of our Visual Force pages start with Apex page, all of our Lightning Web components for the most part are going to start with the standard HTML template tag. Uh, we see some other lightning tags here, lightning card, which remember is kind of like an Apex page lock. And then we have some lightning input fields and a lightning button. So the first lightning input field is the ID uh, that's disabled. Uh, the second, second lightning input is that name field we were typing into. And then we have the lightning button uh, that actually goes and uh, allows us to do some other stuff by clicking the button. Uh, the name, again, we're working with some browser events here. So the name, whenever it changes, we have our on change event. It's going to fire off a method called handle name change. And our button, obviously, we want it to do something when we click it. So we're going to listen for the on click event. When the on click event happens, we're going to call a method called create account. Uh, so we're going to take a look at what those methods are doing in a second. But first, I want to point out uh, the bottom part of this component. And that's the... Uh, this tag here, C view source. So remember I mentioned we can have these C tags, which refer to the default namespace, which means we're bringing in a component that we built in our namespace into this component. So I have another component called view source, and I'm able to bring it into my LDS create record component here. And just like we can pass in parameters to methods in Apex, we can pass in parameters to components. And so here I have a variable in view source called source. And I'm going to pass the value LWC slash LDS create record. We're going to see why that's useful in a second. And then we have some text that we saw on the bottom of that component there too. Uh, but let's segue, or let's uh, sidetrack for a minute here and take a look at this view source component. Remember, we're passing in a value to the source variable. All right, here's view source. Not a ton going on here. Uh, mostly 
think all actually standard HTML tags. We have our template tag, we have a div, uh, we have a paragraph tag, and then we have this a tag, which is a link. And our link comes with a property called href, which is basically the link it's going to. So remember we saw the word view source and it took us to a link. Well, the link it's taking us to is this variable defined by source URL. All right, so a variable called source URL is where the link is taking us. You remember it was a GitHub site. And let's go take a look at how source URL is calculated. So remember we passed in that value to the source variable. So here's the controller for our view source component. Uh, again, we have our import, our export. We have a base URL variable in line four that's going to that kind of uh, GitHub uh, repository. And here in line seven, we have the source variable we passed a value into before. Now, how are we able to pass a value into source? Well, that's using this red box uh, decorator here at API. So we talked about at track before, makes the variable private and makes it reactive. So it automatically re-renders. Well, at API also makes it reactive, so it re-renders, but it also makes it a public variable. So at track is private, at API is public. And because it's a public variable, we were able to pass a value into it from LDS create record. Great, so we have our base URL, we have our source. In our HR for referencing our source URL variable, we have a getter just like we would in Apex. And again, remember all of our logic now is happening in the controller where it belongs. So we calculate our source URL based on the base URL and the source we passed in, and we get our source URL. So we can now use this view source component, pretty much any component we want, and have it take to a different part of our uh, primary base GitHub repository, which is pretty cool. All right, so view source is great. Let's get back onto our LDS create record component here. Remember we had uh, two methods we were working with, handle name change when our text changes and create account when our button is clicked. So let's go take a look at those methods. Uh, so this controller is a little more interesting than some of the other ones. Uh, the first is we're importing more than one thing. So again, we're importing from LWC, but we're also going to import from some other Salesforce libraries. Namely, uh, we're going to import that toast capability we saw when it says success account created. It's called the toast. We're going to import it from a standard Salesforce library. And we're also going to import something uh, from the, another Salesforce library called the UI record API. This is what's going to let us uh, create our accounts without needing any Apex. And so we can call these methods whatever we want. We're going to call them, uh, in this case, show toast event and create record. Uh, and so we can import from LWC. We can import from other Salesforce namespaces. Line four, we can import other components. I'm going to import a custom component I built called LDS utils, again, in the C namespace. And that's going to handle some error handling. Uh, after I import a custom component, I can import my data model. So line five and six, I see I'm importing from my account object and the account.name fields from my account object. Now, while we don't have to do this, I highly recommend it. And the reason being line five and line six, we're importing from objects and fields, but we're actually giving them new names, right? I'm going to import from the account object and I'm gonna call it account underscore object. I'm going to import the name field, I'm gonna call it name underscore field. If later on my account object API name changes or my name field API name changes, normally with Apex gives you an error saying, sorry, your field is referenced here, 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 and you have to go comment it out everywhere and it's a pain to change it. With Lightning Web Components though, by importing them this way, I'm giving them custom names. So Lightning Web Components are metadata aware, meaning if I change the API names later, I don't have to go change all my Lightning Web Components. It's gonna be able to pick it up and dynamically grab the API names when I need them. And so we're gonna see that in a second here too, but for right now I can import from LWC, I can import from Salesforce libraries, I can import custom components, I can import from my data model. All right, so we see line nine, account ID is at tracked. Uh, and then we see our first method we called when I was typing in our on change event, handle name change. And again, we're capturing the event that caused handle name change to fire. We're gonna reset our account ID because it's at tracked. That's why it went away when the account was created and I started uh, typing in that box again. And we're gonna set the name to whatever I typed in, right? The value that fired the event. 
the value of the thing that fired the event. So whatever I typed in gets assigned to name, the account ID gets reset. That's what handle name change is doing. Uh, if I take a look later on in this controller here, I see my create account method. Uh, remember those things we imported up above? We see the first one here in line 19. So as part of our create account method that gets called when we click that button, the on click event, we're gonna be constructing a structure called fields. And our fields is going to grab the field API name from our name field we imported. So again, if the API name changes, that's fine because we're getting in here in line 19 every time anyway. So we're assigning a value to the name field, whatever it happens to be called now. Uh, line 20, we're gonna get our account object, whatever the API name is, doesn't matter. We're getting in here in line 20. Uh, and we're passing in the field structure we just created and then remember, we also imported create record from the record API. We can now call create record uh, in line 21 using the input that we just constructed. We're going to assign the ID of the count that gets created to our account ID variable. Again, because it's abstract and it changed, it automatically shows up once the account is created. And then we have our toast, and we can do some error handling later on as well. Um, but again, we can import things, utilize them later and uh, take advantage of some of our events. Again, no Apex involved in this component at all. Uh, Apex is going away though. Apex still is very useful. And so now we're gonna take a look at a component that actually is utilizing Apex. And again, we're gonna go through the components, but if you don't understand a specific line, don't worry, all the code will be made available. Uh, try to focus on the concepts as much as we can. All right, so let us go now to our Last component here, wire to Apex. Uh, rather, the component's called Apex wire method to property. And we have a couple things in here. We have the word contacts, and we have a list of contacts. Right, so if I go look at all my contacts, I'm going to see that uh, all of these contacts should be showing up here. And... There we go, we see all our contacts and we see them all here as well. Uh, we then see opportunities. We have a list of our opportunities sorted by uh, the amount and we see the amounts following the opportunity names. And then again, we have that view source uh, component down here and we're gonna see the view source. In this case, is actually going to this apex wire method to property. So again, we can pass in a different value for source and we can use the same component to take us to a new place. So we have our contacts, we have our opportunities. Let's see how we're doing that. All right, so here's our Apex wire method to property component. Uh, this one's kind of reverse of the other one. The HTML is a little bit longer and the controller is a little simpler. Uh, so our Apex wire method to property, again, we have a template tag and we have a lightning card tag. We have a standard HTML header one tag in line four. Uh, line six, we have an if statement. So you're familiar with if statements from Apex. Uh, if true, we want to render this stuff. Uh, if not, it's not going to be rendered, right? I think you're probably familiar with the render if, rendered if, uh, visual force as well, same sort of thing here. So if this value is true, that means if this value is not null, essentially, if there's something in this. Uh, and again, we see this variable bind syntax. And so this tells us here in line six, we have a variable in our controller called contacts. Context has a property called data. So if context.data has some value, we're gonna go down here to line seven. We have a for loop, just like we have an apex repeat in visual force. We can have a for loop, uh, so we want a for loop in our apex, for loop in our UI here. For each contact, defined at the end of line seven there, for each contact at context.data, we wanna display line eight, uh, the contact.name. So we display all the contact names. Uh, and then we see line 11, if context.error, the error property of our context variable has a value, we want to use, again, that C tag custom component we built called error panel. And we're gonna pass context.error to an errors variable that again is probably using the add API decorator. All right, so we have our contacts and then the same thing here for opportunities. We have a header tag that says opportunities. We're checking does opportunities.data have a value. If it does for each op and opportunities.data, display the opportunity name and the opportunity amount. Uh, and if there are any errors, again, we can call our custom error component. All right, so that's the UI. Let's take a look at the controller. 
And the controller actually is pretty simple, simple for this one. Um, so again, line one, we see we're importing from LWC. We're used to that by now. Line two, we're going to import from yet another new place. And this is going to be an Apex controller. So we have a controller called contact controller, a method called get contact list, and I'm going to import, uh, and I'm going to call it get contact list. Uh, we then see we have a second Apex controller called the opportunity controller, which is a method called get op list, right? So we have a get contact list, get op list, and then line six and seven, we come to our third decorator at wire. And we have our two variables, contacts and opportunities. And we put the at wire decorator on them. And at wire basically is going to do two things. Uh, it's going to tie a variable to something. It's going to wire it up to something. And in our case, it's going to be an apex method. And it's going to give it two different properties, a dot data property and a dot error property. So dot data is going to be whatever is returned from the thing it's wired up to. So in our case, the return value from the apex method. And dot error is going to be if there's any error from, in our case, the apex method running, that's going to be stored in dot error. So we have our context variable, our opportunities variable. Contacts is wired up to get contact list. Opportunities is wired up to get op list. And the results of those two methods are going to be stored in context.data and opportunities.data, respectively. And the methods themselves, again, are pretty simple. Um, we do see a tag on them, just like we're used to at, you know, using the at future tag. We have an at or enabled tag to let us know it's available for Lightning components. But our get contact list is just going to select fields from contacts, return a list of contacts. And our get op list is just going to select from opportunity, uh, order by the amount and return a list of opportunities. So knowing all that now, if we go back to our UI, right, again, we called our get contact list. We returned a list of contacts. That list is stored in contacts.data because this variable is that wired. So contacts.data has a value, great. For each contact and contacts.data, display the name. If not, uh, call our error panel. And the same thing for opportunities, right? If there's anything in opportunities.data, if our SQL statement ran successfully, display the opportunity name followed by the opportunity amount. All right, uh, so what did we see in all this? Uh, first thing we saw, again, more component markup, right? More tags. Uh, we saw more variable and method bindings. We're used to that by now. Uh, we talked about all these decorators, right? At track, which makes it private and re-renders it at API, which makes it public and re-renders it, and at wire, which lets you wire it to a method and also give it the dot data and dot error properties. And the other thing that I really like is that we can import from anywhere. We can import from the LWC namespace. We can import from other Salesforce namespaces. We can import custom components that we build. We can import from our data model, our objects, our fields. We can import Apex controllers. Pretty much anything we want to import, we can bring it into our Lightning Web components. And I think that's pretty cool. All right, so <laughs> that was all step one. Where do we go from here? Where's step two and beyond? So we know the web development's already popular, and we know that Salesforce has had to evolve to meet demands. We've seen uh, the front end has some similarities to back end code, but we've also seen that there's a lot that's different. And because we are embracing standards, it's my true belief that Lightning Web Components are both the present and future of Salesforce development. Of course, things are going to change at some point, but with Salesforce involved in the web standards, uh, industry standards boards now, I think Salesforce will be a big part of that change moving forward. And again, this is just step one. Step two, I suggest checking out some of the resources Salesforce has made available. Uh, just like with Visual Force components, you can look up what a tag does. Same thing with Lightning Web Components. You can find it on the developer website or my method, usually Google the tag. Uh, you'll find the Salesforce component library. Uh, another really cool uh, resource being offered is the sample gallery, where Salesforce has pre-built applications of Lightning Web Components that you can steal to your heart's content, <laughs> copy and paste, and see how they've gotten things working and use it uh, for your own components as well. Uh, they have a whole website dedicated to Lightning Components, lwc.dev. Uh, there's a good trail mix that uh, helps you learn components, sfdc.co slash lwc. And there's even a new Lightning Web Components Specialist Super Badge available now, which is part of the Salesforce certified JavaScript Developer 1 certification that I recommend looking into.
Uh, and lastly, uh, the instructor that teaches people, uh, if you're familiar with Aura Components and you're interested in moving over to LWC, the instructor that teaches the course I'm moving from Aura to LWC, has put a doc together at bit.ly slash Aura to LWC. All right, so that's great for step two. If you want to take it even one more step further, uh, I suggest looking into the Lightning Design System. Uh, you can find it at lightningdesignsystem.com. Uh, and essentially, it's a bunch of pre-built CSS libraries for you. Comes with utilities, comes with icons, comes with classes. You can plug them in, uh, add some padding, some borders, some uh, styling, some uh, you know trackers like this. We see 25% complete. We see a progress bar on the top. We see some icons. We see an accordion. All this stuff you can add uh, pre-built without having to build your own CSS. Highly recommend checking it out. All right, with that, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you for being a part of Apex Hours YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to check them out using the uh, hashtag Salesforce Apex Hours or at Apex Hours. Uh, feel free to follow me as well, Adam17AMO, uh, apexhours.com, the Farmington user group, uh, bit.ly slash Apex Hours for the YouTube channel, my blog, adamtoarchitect.com, and uh, my plural site course, uh, as well as all of the code uh, that you saw today on my GitHub website. Uh, github.com slash adam17amo slash lwc101. Uh, thank you again so much and uh, have a great rest of your day.